Several years ago, um, how many years has it been, Michael? I don't know, five, six, seven? I had the opportunity to get to know this guy, Michael Miller, and actually travel with him and do some ministry with him in Texas, which was an absolute blessing. And I've learned a ton from him, and you're going to be you're gonna be blessed this morning to hear from him. And um, we're excited to have you here, buddy. Uh, Michael, as you know, we want Crossroads to be more than just 726 West Francis. Matter of fact, Steve's down preaching at some at a deal this weekend down in um, Houston, and he'll be next weekend as well, preaching at a church down there. So we love to see our church beyond 726 West Francis. Michael and his wife have, have started a church down in Denver, and we've been behind this church and supporting this church, and he's going to give us an update on that. But bro, we're just glad you're here, man. We want to hear from you today. Tell us about the, the church, and come on up. I'll pray for you, and we'll continue on. Give this guy a hand. This is a great guy. Excited to hear from you, man. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thanks for this time. Thanks for all that's going on at Crossroads Church. And uh, Lord, for our visitors here today, we just want to welcome them. Uh, we're glad they're here. They are our guests, and we want to connect with them, get to know them, and encourage them. Father, uh, we also just want to pray for this time here as Michael uh, leads us and shares from the Word. Lord, thank you for what we've already shared this morning. And we look forward to what he's going to share with us. And at the same time, we lift up Steve and Derek as they lead down in uh, Texas today um, at Sukkot. Father, just bless them and, and just anoint their time as well, Lord. So thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you that our church goes beyond 726 West Francis. So many things going on, and we're grateful and looking forward to hearing what's happening in Denver. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Honored to be here. I should probably ask you, and I should have asked this before we even started, but uh, what time should I try to land the plane on this? Uh, yeah, shoot for around, say, 9.45. 9.45, okay. I'm sorry. I got you for 40 minutes. You're stuck for another... Um, <laughs> I, I, a couple of things. Uh, Lee, you cracked me up when you were talking about tonight. He was like, you know, it's going to be more of a round thing, not so much a talking down. The morning is going to be me talking down to you, but the evening will be... <laughs> so I had to razz you a little bit. <laughs> um, I do love that. I'll make a plug for that tonight because I love what that stands for. And I like that you call it the outpost. Uh, it just sounds, I mean a little bit more trendy than what many of us call things. So uh, <laughs> um, I'm excited about that. I think, you know, oftentimes we miss this when we talk about the new covenant and the idea that God gave his spirit to us. Uh, we can tend to reduce it to a, a series of propositional truths, like, you know, how you're saved and things like that. And, and it's no longer by works, but by grace. But one of the major components of the new covenant is this idea that no longer uh, will it just be the special few anointed people in the Old Testament Testament, they get the spirit like the kings and the priests, but now God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And so a central component and often a very lost component of the new covenant is that now the people of God are spirit led people, not just the priests and kings. It's all of us. If you're a believer in Christ, there's something unique that God has given you, and it's to be used as a contribution to others in the body of Christ. Um, so Christianity is not a spectator sport. Although it may feel like that sometimes on Sunday mornings, uh, it, it actually is never meant to be that way. We all have gifts that we bring to share with one another to further the work of the kingdom and continue the work of, of sanctification in our hearts. And so tonight is a bit more like that. It's a gift. Everybody brings it and shares it. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of that. A um, little update on... Um, What's going on in Denver? Just for the record, for those of you who don't know, uh, I wouldn't have a church to pastor down in Denver if Crossroads hadn't stepped in and gotten behind us. Um, so the elders here have been my oversight in Denver until we have a local plurality of elders established there. Um, and they've also contributed, you guys have contributed to making sure that that work can happen. I wouldn't have had a salary this last year or in 2020 that, you know, when the COVID pandemic broke out, had it not been for the church here supporting us. Uh, so a lot of gratitude is, is do your way because of what we're getting to do there. Um, it's been, uh, I mean, planting a church in COVID, uh, prophetically, you figured I should have seen that coming. Um, <laughs> Uh, probably not the best time to plant a church, or actually maybe it's the best time to plant a church, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, for us, it has been 
incredibly good, uh, profitable, and not just for uh, my family, but for the community and, and for Denver itself. When a lot of churches are shutting down because they're so big, they can't meet the mask mandate and the requirements in Denver, we were small little units able to, to continue to gather despite what was happening worldwide. Um, so really rather advantageous for us. And we were able to set a culture of it's this church is going to be focused around the home primarily, uh, where everybody can bring their gift and that the, the gathering that we have of, of all of these groups will, will, uh, be a time of, of teaching of the word and of, of corporate celebration of what God has done for us. And so that's kind of what we've been able to do. Um, we've, I, I would say we are growing and that's a very good, healthy sign, um, we're in the process of, of going through an elder training with one of, uh, one of the guys in the community. Um, I'm trying to think what else to update you on. Uh, because of a podcast I do called The Remnant Radio, there's been a lot of uh, opportunities to travel and teach. And when I get to do that, I take a, a whole team and slew of guys with me uh, who are sort of growing in this stuff and, and learning how to hear God's voice and to be spirit led. And uh, so that's been a really unique and fun opportunity. Um, and as far as the church itself, we've really had a vision to, to equip the church. I think all too often um, the church can be centered around a special gifted person who usually has a microphone, and we've wanted to get away from that idea as the model for Christian living. Uh, really, the, the job of the person with a microphone is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so what does that mean for all of you guys? Well, it means the very things that Jesus did, you should be doing. And so that's kind of the, the aim of our community gatherings is to train and equip others to do the work of Jesus, to train them how to give the proclamation of the gospel, to train them how to demonstrate the work of the kingdom, uh, praying for the sick, uh, hearing from God and giving uh, prophetic words, um, opening up their homes and hospitality to serve the poor or those who are in need. Uh, all of those things are sort of part of what we're doing as a community. And it's, it's been happening. We're about to kick off home groups in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, where these home groups are going to be, well, we were basically a home group until we grew out of that, my home and had to start meeting in a bigger facility. And so now we're reestablishing those home groups again, where that, that sort of center of the community is going to take place and the life of the community will take place. So very excited about all of that. I feel like I'm just rambling now. Uh, <laughs> that relates to a lot of what we're talking about. Um, you know, it's, it's been kind of interesting that Steve is going through Revelation. When I uh, talked to him about coming up here, I was telling him I, I have two different kind of messages that I've been sort of mulling between, but one of them is, is straight out of the book of Revelation, uh, and it's about overcoming great difficulties and how one of the ways that God allows us to, to overcome is through the family of Christ. Um, that God created this thing called the body of Christ, and he has intentionally knit us together, knowing that we're so, so all completely different and in desperate need of one another. Um, and that becomes really apparent. If you go through 1 Corinthians 12, most people, like when we read it, we think about, oh, well, that's the chapter on the gifts, but it's more than that. It's about how God has uniquely knit people from different backgrounds, different races, different socioeconomic classes, put us together in one thing called the body of Christ and how we can never truly fulfill our calling as a church unless we're in unity and in unison with one another that you have gifts that I don't have, I have gifts that you don't have, and I desperately need the gift that you have, and you desperately need the gift that I have, and, and together we make up that body. So, um, and specifically about how that body is going to be what we need for one another and what the early church needed for one another when it came to overcoming obstacles. So, um, when you read Revelation, I, it's just funny because Steve happens to have, I guess, finished off this last week in his series exactly where the message that I'm preaching today picks up. Uh, so he finished it off talking about one of the things that the church had to overcome and how the reward for having overcome is a much bigger picture, how there's the spiritual world, the spiritual reality, and uh, and that at the end of the days, God is going to give us a, a, an authority to rule and reign over this entire world. Some of us are going to even judge angels, as the scriptures say, which is pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, but how did they get to that place of ruling and reigning? Well, it was through the thing that came right before it, overcoming great obstacles. 
Um, so today I want to talk about something that I had to overcome uh, and how uh, God has something for all of us to overcome. As a matter of fact, when you read those letters to the seven churches written in Revelation chapter two through chapter three, you're going to find one repeated phrase, to him who overcomes. It's used every single time in all seven letters to all the different churches in Revelation, to him who overcomes. And then the next phrase, which is really cool, is I will give, which implies, I mean, it, that sort of speaks to the nature of God, right? He doesn't necessarily zap away all your problems, but if you overcome those problems, he has a promise of reward, so, and here's the truth. A lot of us think that when we come to Christ, that Christ is going to demand all of this from us, all of these things, which is true. He's going to demand everything you have. Everything you are is the demand of Christ. And he has the right to demand it being our creator. But what he will take, he will return in a different way. In other words, you cannot outgive Jesus Christ. God is the giver of all good things, and he will outgive everything that you have to give up. So giving your life, he will give you a brand new one. That new life that he has for you is far more significant than the one you're trying to create for yourself. You cannot outgive God. He is the giver of all good things. Um, okay, I'm, I'm kind of all over this, but let me, let me start here with this family idea. Um, when God put together the body of Christ, it was not intended to be a corporate structure and organization, although oftentimes it may have looked that way. Um, what he created was a family. And in that family came people from all different backgrounds. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, Paul will make this big distinction about how, you know, in the former days, it was just the, the Jews who were given the, the Yahweh as their God. But now God has knit together people from the Jewish nation with all of the other nations of the earth. And so with that come people that you may not necessarily relate well with. Uh, matter of fact, and even when, when God created this thing called the body of Christ at Acts chapter two, and he pours out the spirit on all flesh, and, and then it extends to the Samaritans, and then it extends to the Gentile nations, even prior to doing that, he called together 12 disciples. Now, when you look at these disciples, most of us, if we're creating a team to, to, or a little family to accomplish a great purpose, we would probably do it different than Jesus did. For example, think about a couple of the guys that he put together on the same team. You've got one guy named Matthew who's a tax collector. You know anything about tax collectors? Well, if you're a Jewish man, uh, tax collectors were the most hated people in, in, in the Jewish nation because they were Jews that were basically serving their Roman oppressors. So if you're Jewish, you're looking at that tax collector going, what a traitor, I can't believe he would do this. Uh, tax collectors were known to t take taxes from the people. And now, now you got to remember, the Jewish people were so heavily taxed, they, couldn't, uh, they could barely afford food. That's how bad it was. That's how bad the taxation was. Now, in our country, they tried to tax us on tea, and we decided to throw the whole thing in the ocean. And we don't put up with that kind of taxation in this country, do we? No, but, but this is what was going on in the Jewish nation, and yet you had Jewish people serving the Roman emperor, taking those taxes and handing them over to Rome, and then on top of that, demanding a little extra just for themselves. That's the kind of person that Jesus called to be one of his disciples. And he happened to team him up. I mean, think about this. Jesus at one time is going to send the 12 out in pairs of two. I wonder how he paired them together. Now, this would just be speculating, but what if he took that tax collector and uh, paired him together with another, another of his 12 disciples, a guy named Simon, who's also called the Zealot? You know what a Zealot is? The Zealots were a particularly zealous group of people. They were known for taking uh, little shards of glass and bones and sort of melding them together to create little makeshift knives, and they would stick them in the side of people they considered weren't faithful to the Jewish nation. You think Matthew wants to be in the same room with that guy? And yet God thought this was a really great idea. Let's put people from completely different backgrounds, completely different aspirations, 
uh, maybe socioeconomic class. Let's put them together and they're going to transform the world. Right? That's what it says in Acts. You know, they, they turn the whole world upside down. Uneducated, you know, Jewish guys from different backgrounds. You, you, you have no idea how God is knitting us together and the kind of people he's putting together to create a family. I'm watching this happen in Denver. He's creating a little church family from people from totally different backgrounds. I got one guy who was, who's, I mean, <laughs> I think of the ministry trip I took out. Uh, I went to Cincinnati, Ohio just about three weeks ago. I took a small team with me, about three other guys. One of them grew up in Denver, uh, came to Christ later in life. Another one grew up in Texas. He was raised in a Christian home. Another one grew up in Texas, was not cre- uh, raised in a Christian home. He was actually raised by uh, two uh, homosexual women. Those were his parents. Uh, he came to Christ later in life, was a drug addict, um, I mean, divorce, you know, had, had a kid, got divorced, and then came to Christ. I mean, just a, a crazy radical story. And, and this was my ministry team. These are the guys God is using to transform the world, disciples of Christ, from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic classes, different levels and very degrees of sin and, and struggles from, you know, story of origin and upbringing. Uh, and I watched these guys get up in a room and, and begin to operate in the gifts of the spirit that God had given them. And one of the guys uh, called out a man and said, I feel like you're a pastor. I feel like actually you're an elder of a church and you're in a conflict with your other elders right now and it has to do with the very thing that we're talking about this weekend. Sure enough, the guy had traveled two hours from Illinois and he was uh, an elder in his church and he was in a conflict uh, with the other elders about the gifts of the Spirit. And this is just some young guy who grew up in a broken home uh, and had come to Christ and God was using him to, to do these things. God's pouring out his Spirit on all flesh. He takes these guys, puts them on a team and he expects them to transform the world. Um, It's interesting how these guys from different backgrounds are going to need each other when when the real uh, persecution starts. The trials of life begin. So you see in Jerusalem, uh, these guys become sort of saturated and they they fail to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to go into all the nations and make disciples, right? Where are they 20 years later? Well, they're still in Jerusalem. (laughs) Have they gone to the nations yet? No. So you know what God does is he allows persecution to come in. And ne- next thing you know, they get dispersed. We got, we got one guy, Thomas, who goes all the way to the southern part of India where he actually gets speared to death after preaching the gospel. And now there's a church that exists there to this day because of Thomas's work. But God used pers- persecution to separate the church and, and to get them to go into the nations and make disciples. It's why we are here today. Because those disciples didn't stay in Jerusalem. Eventually, they went out and they preached the same gospel. Um, We see this written in James, right? He says, consider all joy, brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds, right? He tells them to consider it joy because of the work he's going to do in creating faith in the family of God when they're being persecuted, when they're experiencing trials. Don't you think it's interesting that the very first line uh, of James chapter one is uh, James, a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Why are they dispersed abroad? Trials in life. Uh, How many of you like the promises of God? Any of you like the promises of God? And we got these little books that are so neat to go to. Like I'm just claiming my promises, brother. You know what are the promises of God? Nobody ever tells you. You won't find it in the little book of God's promises. In this life, you will have trials. (laughs) <laughs> promise of God right there in the scriptures. But nobody tells you that. Why is that? What don't they tell us about the promises of God being one of the major ones? Trials, persecutions, overcoming great difficulties. Um, listen, I, kind of, I personally came up from an incredibly broken home. Mom and dad divorced at age one. Dad married another woman with six kids. Meanwhile, he couldn't pay child support to my mom to raise the four kids that he already had. So at age four, when he remarried, it was like somebody, you could have just branded me with the word rejection and abandonment. Um, That wound of rejection 
I carried with me into my adult life, sabotaging every relationship I got into. Now here's the crazy part. One of the, the cool things was, is Jesus saved me. He saved me. He took me out from a life of sin, a life of trying to do it my own way, uh, a life that I was sabotaging, and he saved me and brought me into the family of God. This family of God I was going to need desperately when uh, my rejection and abandonment issues started uh, manifesting themselves to the point where I was ready to take my own life. Got, almost got married twice. Um, the second relationship, I sabotaged, just blew that thing up. Right? It was one of those th- kind of situations where you know, the, I would text my girlfriend at the time and I didn't hear back from her and I immediately started thinking, well, she must not love me anymore. It had only been five minutes. But that's how much I struggled with rejection and abandonment. You know, the really, the, the, the really ironic part about it was the biggest hindrance to me overcoming my rejection and abandonment issues were all the miracles I had seen. A lot of you can go, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Right, that's why I said it was ironic. It doesn't make sense. You see, I'd seen, um, blind, or I'd seen deaf ears open. I'd seen flat feet change shape right in front of my eyes. I saw one young man in Denmark. Uh, he had flat feet. He was not a believer. Prayed for his flat feet. Uh, he gets healed. He doesn't realize he's healed until he puts on his shoes, and he actually can feel like they feel different. And he's looking down at his feet, and he starts cussing out loud about how his feet have changed shape. Again, not a believer. Uh, this young man comes to Christ. And, and I'm telling you, I, I'd seen these kind of things. Tons of it. I met her two, two months ago down in Corpus Christi. Pray for a, a lady who is uh, completely deaf in what was it, her, my right, her left. Okay, I got to try to remember how this played out. Her, her left ear, completely deaf. No, it was her right. I was praying this way. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, that's her left. I'm so confused. Her left, my right. Anyway, she's deaf in her right ear and she's partially blind in her right ear. She had had uh, pancreatic cancer and because of it, they had to remove most of her pancreas. And so she had just a little bit of her pancreas left and because of that, it created diabetes. And the diabetes took her vision. Um, the ear problem, we're not exactly sure what happened there, but it was completely deaf in that ear and had been for five years. Now her eye, when I say she was partially blind, here's what she could see. Like if you were looking straight ahead, you guys can see me, right? You're looking straight ahead, you're looking at me. Imagine if all you could see was my hair and my legs and that's it. Everything in between is completely black. That was her vision. Prayed for her, put my hand on her eye, simple prayer, wasn't yelling at her. Uh, the volume of your voice does not determine power. Uh, Prayed for a very simple prayer, and I said, Lord Jesus, would you come and heal what the uh, diabetes has destroyed, and let everything in this eye be restored in Jesus' name. And I said, why don't you check it out and tell me how, if you notice any difference. So she covers her right eye, and she starts looking at me, and she starts counting the buttons on my shirt. And she goes, I said, that's right, there's three buttons. And she just starts bawling, crying. She should not have been able to do that. And then we pray for her deaf ear and it completely gets healed. I've seen a lot of these kind of things happen. Matter of fact, it's my conviction and belief that that's called normal Christianity. Normal Christianity. And it's not reserved for just the special guys with the microphone. It's reserved for the body of Christ. That's my conviction. Uh, I think it's a biblical conviction. I would encourage you to have that conviction. Um, My point in mentioning this is when it came to my rejection and abandonment issues, I I just prayed and thought that God would zap it away like he zapped away a blind eye. A sabotage relationship. God, please, I I, I know this is my fault. Please heal this thing. I've seen you heal flat feet. I've seen you heal deaf ears. Now I've seen him heal a blind eye. Why won't you heal this thing over here? You heal all of these other things, but not this thing. I'm telling you, I I was suicidal. Uh, My roommate at the time, he was so scared of what I might do to myself that he hid the knives in the kitchen. 
That's how bad it got. And so I'm praying, God, you've got to take this. You've got to heal this. Why do you think God doesn't take away everything in our lives? I think there's a number of reasons, um, but I think it has to do with what Steve preached last week about this reward and reigning and ruling. Um, We see it played out now. For me, um, my issue was the abandonment and rejection. Now, what I didn't know is that God had given me every tool I needed to overcome my issue. And yet I was praying for him to just zap it away. When we read these kind of things, right? Um, uh, oh gosh, what is it? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5. It says, for though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but made powerful by God for the tearing down of strongholds. Hold on a second. So God's given us these weapons to do warfare, but they're not weapons as we're accustomed to, right? They're not swords. They're not guns. The weapons God has given us are spiritually empowered, And they're effective at tearing down strongholds. What is a stronghold? It says we tear down arguments. That seems like such a strange thing. What does it mean tearing down arguments? Every arrogant obstacle that is raised up against the knowledge of God, we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. What is a stronghold? Knowledge raised up against the knowledge of God. So think of it this way. Here's what God says. Here's the stronghold of the mind. The knowledge that's raised up against. These two things don't coexist. So for me, what was the stronghold of my mind? Well, at the core of who I was, I didn't believe that I was worth knowing nor loving. That was the stronghold. So the closer I got to marriage, the more I thought this girl is going to find out that I'm really not worth sticking around for. And here's the thing about the strongholds that that we have in our heads. They feel true. That's why they're so strong. But not everything you feel is true is actually true. For instance, uh, how many of you uh, don't feel like you hear God? Okay, never mind. Let me rephrase that. How many of you feel like you hear God? Okay, so some of you raise your hands on that one. Whether you feel it or not doesn't describe whether or not it's true. It doesn't determine whether or not it's true. The scriptures do, right? My sheep know my voice. So whether you think you hear God or not uh, is actually not important. Well, it is important for you, but it doesn't determine whether or not it's true. The scriptures determine truth. That's the knowledge of God. So here I am thinking I'm not worth knowing and not worth loving, not worth sticking around for. What does the truth of God say? You are worth knowing. You are worth loving. You are worth sticking around for, right? We know something's worth by what someone will pay for it. What did the Son of God pay for me? So we know exactly what someone's worth is because Jesus Christ died. The Son of God, infinite worth, shed his blood for us telling us exactly what our worth is. God has given us this weapons. One of the primary weapons he's given us is the family of God. It's meant to be there to help us overcome the trials and difficulties in life. Um, I had a, three friends of mine that when I was trying to overcome these, this stronghold of my mind, I had them on speed dial. They knew that if I was calling, here's what we're going to deal with. We're going to deal with whatever the lie was that I was believing They were going to help me to discover that, despite how true it felt to me. And then they were going to give me the truth so I could overcome it. This is sort of what Paul talks about when he says, hey, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. How? Speaking to one another in psalms, uh, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart, right? It's it's the washing of the Word that's taking place. Um, 
And, and here's the crazy part. I, I, I'm here today. I'm a married man. I got two kids. I don't worry about my wife leaving me. Um, but here, here's the real clincher to all of this. When you read Revelation, seven churches and all of them given the same promised phrase, to him who overcomes, I will give. Notice what you won't hear. I'm going to zap away whatever this problem is. He doesn't zap it away. Now let's, let's just look at it real quickly. Go to uh, um, Revelation 2.7. This is the Ephesian church. We're told that they had left their first love. That's a big problem. All of you agree with that? That's something that's meant to be overcome. To him who overcomes, he will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That sounds good. Look at Revelation 2.11, the church in Smyrna. We're told that they were going to be thrown into prison and some were being asked to be faithful unto death. No promise of deliverance from prison like Peter. They're not promised to be set free from prison. Matter of fact, he's telling them, some of you are going to be thrown in prison. Some of you are going to die. To him who overcomes, he will not be hurt by the second death. He's not zapping the problem away, is he? Uh, Pergamum, this one's crazy. We're told that in Pergamum, this is where the throne of Satan was. That's just weird to think about. A little side bit of information. Did you know that this was an altar built to Zeus? It's called the uh, the Acropolis. Uh, When Hitler rose to power, at the very height of his power, he bought this altar built to Zeus from Turkey and had it brought over and rebuilt brick by brick in Berlin. Throne of Satan was in Berlin at the height of Nazi Germany. Spooky, isn't it? Here's what he says of them. Throne of Satan is there. We're told that they were, they were uh, following the doctrines of a false teacher who would lead others to eat food, sacrifice to idols, and according to Clement of Alexandria, to commit strange acts of sexual immorality. Here's what he says to them. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on it, which no one knows but he who receives it. I don't know what half of these things are. Maybe some of you have done a really good deep dive into Revelation, and maybe Steve will cover some of this in the next coming weeks. All I know is that these are gifts given by God. These are rewards for having overcome great difficulties. You don't get these rewards without overcoming these difficulties. Only to those that overcome. The church in Theotira, this is uh, Revelations 2, 26 to 28. Many of them gave into the teachings by a self-proclaimed prophetess whom Jesus called Jezebel. That's not a nice name. We're told that she taught the deep things of Satan and she encouraged sexual immorality. And here's what he says to them. To him who overcomes, I will give authority over the nations. I will give him the morning star. Again, I don't know what this stuff is, but it's only given to those who overcome. In Sardis, they were known for their good deeds, but they never experienced the power of God to bring about transformation. They held to a form of godliness. Here's what it says there, Revelation 3, 5. To him who overcomes, he will be clothed in white garments. I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, this one, I have some inkling of what it means. Think about what it just says. To him who overcomes, I'm going to proclaim that person's name in front of the Father and in front of the angels. This should serve as like a a very visceral thing. You should be able to picture this in your head when you think through this. Uh, What's your name? And can you come here real quick? I'm going to make a little object lesson. I'm so sorry on the front end, but you're going to thank me afterwards, okay? Um, right. Just stand here for a second, Ann. I just want you to look out here. This is the scene that's going to take place. Anne has dealt with trials in her life that she's had to overcome. God has decided that he's going to give Anne a reward for having overcome whatever these trials are that she's facing. Here's how he's going to reward her. 
He's going to stand her up in front of the father. He's going to stand her up in front of the angels. Now, when he says the angels, we don't think about what that means. These beings are things that even the apostles and others have been tempted to worship. There's a magnificence and a glory that God has shared with these beings that would cause us to think they're gods and we should worship them. And yet God is saying, I want to take Anne, put her up in front of the father and in front of all of these beings and tell them who she is. He goes, many people on the earth, they couldn't make sense of Anne. They would look at her struggles and go, well, she's seen the miracles of God. How, how is it that she could struggle with these things, right? And they judge her. And yet God is going, but look what she's overcome. Most of you don't know her history. You don't know the obstacles that she had to deal with growing up. And so now I'm here and I get the bragging rights for what she has overcome. It is God's great joy to brag on Anne in front of creatures that we would be tempted to worship. And it's God's great joy to have the bragging rights for all of you as well. Could God have done this? Could he, have, could, he, could he be able to brag about Anne like this if he had just zapped her problems away? Are you thankful now that I did this? Yeah, come here, give me a hug. God bless you. You can go back down. Why doesn't he zap your problems away? There are some things that God has in the future for you that you could not get if you didn't have this obstacle to overcome. Now listen, I'm all for the miraculous. I'm all for healing the sick. I pray for the sick all the time. I do conferences and I will literally for hours up until midnight pray for person after person. I love that stuff. I want God, I want to see as many healings and miracles as I can on this side of the resurrection as possible. I also know though that some things don't get zapped away. Some things we are left to overcome because God gets the bragging rights for when we do. And here's the glorious great news. He's already given you everything you need to overcome. Weapons that are spiritually empowered for the tearing down of strongholds, knowledge and arguments raised up against the knowledge of God. Here's the worst part. I mean, uh, uh, the most encouraging part, I think, in this. Uh, when I was dealing with my abandonment issues, God, I, I've tried and I've failed over and over again. I'm never going to overcome these issues. Please heal me. Ever felt like the problem you're dealing with is insurmountable? You just can't overcome it? Now, who's right? You or God? See, we think we can't overcome it. Yet, God thinks you can. And if he thinks you can overcome your problem, what does that say about you and your problem? You can overcome it. And maybe he's slow to just take it away because there's something he wants for you in that process. Um, church in Philadelphia, we're told that they had persevered and held fast to what they had been taught. Their rewards seemed assured. And yet he still says this, to him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not have to go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. The Laodiceans, we in the West are most often compared to them. Uh, we're told that they were lukewarm and being lukewarm wasn't good, right? You needed to either be uh, hot and have a, that healing thing like the hot springs in Laodicea or cold, something refreshing and, and life-giving. But because they're lukewarm, he says this, to him who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. All seven churches, all told that they had obstacles to overcome, no promises of healing, no promises of deliverance, just a promise of reward for having overcome great difficulties. 
This letter written to the churches and uh, about the revelation of the Christ has been circulated to this day and has been given to us. What does the church and crossroads have to overcome? All of you have individual things to overcome. Is there something the church as a whole has to overcome? I mean, you guys live in Aspen. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's like there's this question. Um, man, there's one thing that Jesus will say to one very, very wealthy church. You say that you have riches, but I say that you are poor. It'd be interesting to find out what that means and if that applies. Um, I look forward to the day when God gets to brag on me for what I've overcome in life. Here's the great thing. When a teacher gives you a test, does the teacher give you the test with the hopes that you're going to fail it? No. Matter of fact, when you get a test, it's so that you can prove what you know. For us, if we've been given tests in this life, it's to prove what Christ has done us, in us. Um, I, I sabotaged two relationships prior to getting married. People questioned, like, how could he, you know, fall into this trap? I mean, it seemed deaf ears open, right? All of these sort of like speculations and judgments, like, how could, how could that guy? And yet, I did. Um, I would say it was sin for me to fall in that kind of fear and act out of that kind of fear. It was sin for me. God didn't zap it away. He let me overcome it. Uh, one, of my, one of the most comforting verses in Scripture to me comes out of the Proverbs where he says, the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. You see why that might be encouraging? You see, it means that God is not defining us by what we fall into as believers, righteous men, but by our willingness to get back up and keep fighting. You may fail a test seven times, but get back up. That's how God defines us, as people who are willing to continue to fight in the midst of the struggle, not in the absence of it. And there is no, no thing to fight if there is no struggle. We need these struggles. So that said, I'm going to pray for you guys. Uh, tonight, I'd encourage you to come. We are going to pray for healing. We're going to see if the Lord speaks to us as the people of God. That should be the, the defining marker in our lives is that we're people led by the Spirit of God. It's part of the new covenant promise. Uh, and we're going to experiment some of that tonight. Uh, experience and experiment. I think both of those are appropriate. Um, and then uh, I'm happy to pray for some of you even after this. Um, but I want you to stand up and I want to pray for you as I close the time out. Am I close on time? Good, okay. Uh, here's one thing I can guarantee is true of all of you. In this life, you will have trials. <laughs> Promise of God. So you're standing up as a person that has something to overcome. That's not going to be a surprise because the scriptures make it pretty clear. So then my prayer for you is that God would help you know what it is he's given you to overcome that obstacle. Sound good? Put your hands just like this, like you're receiving something. Um, God, I don't want to talk about you like you're not in the room. Uh, I recognize, Spirit, that you are moving, that you're alive, that you're active. Um, and so I just want to invite you into this place and give uh, room for you to reign once again. Holy Spirit, would you, uh, well, I, I guess I pray as Paul would pray, that you'd pour out the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Would you do that for Crossroads Aspen? Would you uh, speak to every single person uh, in the midst of their trial and what they're overcoming? And would you help them to know the tools that you've given them to fight this war, the, the, the weapons of warfare that are spiritually empowered, would you open their eyes to what those things are? And Father, would they embrace these struggles that are in front of them as people with great hope, knowing that there is a reward for overcoming whatever it is? Even now, would you speak to them about what those trials are, what the struggles are? 
both personally and as a body. And I ask that, uh, well, I should just say, Lord, I look forward to uh, seeing you get the bragging rights of them in heaven. Thank you so much. Lord, if there's any sick in this room, any who are uh, injured and have infirmity, if there's any uh, who are part of this body that are in the hospital or family members that are in the hospital because of the pandemic, we ask that you would honor Psalm 10720. You said you sent your word and you healed them and you delivered them from destruction. Would you do that for all who are sick and infirmed? Would you send your word and bring healing and restoration? Even now, um, areas of our bodies that are broken in need of healing, uh, disc in the back, let them be refilled, cartilage restored, arthritis removed, problems with the vision, let them be healed, problems with the hearing, let them be healed. Would you move in great power in this community? showing them t tangible signs that you are still reigning today as you were in biblical times. We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.